Welcome to EPG Patshala, the lessons in culture studies ongoing. This is Pramod Nair of the Department of English, the University of Hyderabad. Today we will be looking at a specific approach to culture studies via Marxism and Marxist critical theory. What does classical Marxism do that helps us read commodities, consumer cultures, celebrity fashions in culture studies today? Classical Marxism believes that society is organized around the forces of production, questions of labor, wage and capital. In other words, the foundations of all aspects of the social order, whether it is the family, the church or education, rely upon an economic foundation. We will come back to the theory of base and superstructure in a while, but initially what we need to understand is that Marxism believes very strongly that the foundation for all social relations are the modes of production, which means in the earlier era, it was agriculture and feudalism. In the later era, in the age of industrial modernity, starting roughly around the last decades of the 18th century, it was the factory system of production. We now are in the age of the digital and the cybernetic forms of production. These forms of production enable a social order to organize itself into various classes. Class as an organizing principle of the social order is central to Marxist thought. Where earlier theorists and philosophers like uh, Frederick Hegel argued about progress, that every event in history is connected to and produced from a previous event in history, Marxism argued that all historical processes are the result of a conflict between classes. What does this mean? This means very simply that a tension or conflict between the land owning class or the land working class, the owner of the factory versus the laborer in the factory determines the nature of social relations. We are talking here, please understand, not only of mechanics of production such as the factory or the agricultural uh, field or the farm sector, but also in terms of profit and wage. Money as attained through somebody else's labor and money as attained through my labor, as in what I earn as wage. What Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, the founders of Marxist theory were arguing was, all social relations depend on who owns the process of production, who gains the profits from the process of production and who labors to make sure that the process of production goes on. This seems perfectly fine at one level. However, the problem as Marx and Engels pointed out was, the people who do not own the system of production, who do not control the mechanics of production, work as wage labor in a factory or on a farm for specific number of hours a day for which they are paid a certain amount of wage. This also means, and this is the crucial part, the laborer has no greater investment in the process of production or in the product. He only delivers a certain amount of energy through his body or her body into the factory and they are paid a compensatory wage. This is what Marx famously called alienation. Alienation is when the laborer is distanced from the process of production and the product that he or she manufactures. Marx argued that this was over a period of time detrimental to the nature of production itself because the laborer has no interest, no expertise other than the small niche area in which he or she works. What are the implications of this problem of uh, production and its processes? First is what I have already mentioned. A conflict between classes emerges where the laborer begins to think I work and I get a wage, but where are the profits from the things I make? The profits from the things he makes go to the capitalist owner of the factory. It does not ever come to the laborer. Marx argued that this becomes the centerpiece, the cornerstone of the entire social edifice because all modes of production are finally forms of social relations. This key insight into the way society is organized is at the heart of Marxist theory and for us understanding culture we have one more step to take. This step also comes from classical Marxism 
but has been built upon and developed by later Marxist thinkers whom you will be reading like Louis Althusser and Raymond Williams. Marx distinguishes between the foundational aspects of society and the built up cultural forms in that society. What do we mean by this? The foundational forms are what I have already described, the modes of production, the economics of it and the products. He called it the base. The base is a set of economic relations, forms of production in any social order. Now, a social order, however, does not consist of only the factors of production, the farmhouse or the factory. Um, all aspects of the social order include something else. For example, it includes religion, it includes entertainment, cultural practices like dance or music and literature. It includes structures like the family, law and order, all of these. Marx called it the superstructure. An argument enabled by his principal uh, philosophical position that everything proceeds from the economic base. Marx and later theorists like Raymond Williams and Louis Althusser argued the superstructure is built upon an economic foundation, is built upon an economic base. The superstructure is what we call culture. That is where our entry into culture studies begins. Cultural practices which includes pulp fiction, science fiction movies, Hollywood, music, all of that, sports, celebrity cultures and films, they all are built upon an economic base. And the Marxist theory of culture argues that this base superstructure model is something we need to examine for one particular reason. Please recall what I've already said, that the economic foundation of society will determine class identity and class relations. This means, effectively speaking, um, those who own the factors of production, those who control the mechanics of production are wealthier and therefore have more power. That brings us to the key concept in the later part of what we have to say today. Power is with those who control the means of production. But power is a more or less abstract concept because we don't quite know how it plays out. We will come to that in a while. But what is important to understand is that those who control the mechanics of production, those who control the economics of a city or a town or, or any social organization are, in a, are able to enforce power through certain institutions. Whether it's the law, the military, the monarchy or the school system, power operates through institutional structures. These institutional structures, remember, are part not of the economic base but of the superstructure. In other words, power operates or comes out of the economic foundation but seeps through the entire superstructure which is built up all the way in, in, in many layers. What you need to understand is culture is a, is a superstructural condition which conceals within it the actual nature of power relations. Now this at the present moment in our conversation might be a little bit difficult to follow but Hold on, we'll, we'll come back to this. What I'm trying to get you to see is that the economic foundation of any social order will generate its own superstructures. Power lies here at, at the economic level, but power also comes here. How it comes is the question we want to ask. For example, you will ask, how can you make an argument that films are about power or music is about power or sports are about power? That if you are saying that cultural practices are about power, that uh, superstructure is about power. I don't see power in operation. See, the operations of power are rarely visible in that sense. The big contribution that people like Raymond Williams, Louis Althusser have made to the study of culture is to argue that all cultural practices are essentially practices of power. Now, how this operates, we will come to in a bit. In order to explain this shift from the economic base to the superstructure, we need to understand a couple of concepts. One is a concept of ideology, which again Marx and Marx's theory were very instrumental in coining. Ideology is a system of thinking, a system of beliefs, a system of the way we imagine. And ideology is a way of 
making other people believe what you believe in. So if I want to convert you into a believer in Marxism, how I deliver this talk is part of an apparatus, a part of a system. Now you will say, but you're only lecturing. That's the point I'm trying to make via Marxism. The institutional mechanism of this lecture, of the Epat Shala program or a classroom or a postgraduate honors course is the institutional structure where what we call a syllabus, a lesson, a teaching unit conceals the kind of belief systems I as a teacher want you as a student to understand. Ideology is a system where the factors of production remain invisible, where the power operates invisibly, but where you as a student agree with what I am saying. In other words, we are talking about the conversion of a group of people into our ways of thinking. So culture is a system where films, television serials, sports assume or make you assume and make you believe that this is only entertainment. But in fact, what they do is convey a particular model of thinking. Let's take the most common example that we understand in any of these things, the representation of women. The stereotyping of women over a period of say 50 to 60 years in contemporary Hollywood or Bollywood films makes us believe women are like this. Why do you believe that? Because after all, there are so many representations in cinema, in television serials, in comics and this, that and other, which tell you this. And you say, all of them are saying this, it must be true. The ideology of patriarchy, of unequal gender relations, is a structure of power. Men over or dominating over women. This is not visible, as in we do not see the power play out. Power is invisible but effective. But it manifests in cultural representations. If we are studying culture, we are effectively studying the power that the male gender has over the female gender. This is not, like I said, delivered directly. It's delivered through symbols, representations, and cultural practices. Which is why Marxism tells us, when you read this abstract thing called culture, you are actually reading power, which is on the side. Power which you don't see, but power which looks like, that's a popular film, that's a great book, that's a wonderful novel, this is a romance. These cultural practices conceal power relations and in the process of concealment, present to you an ideology. Ideology is something we unconsciously assimilate, imbibe. This is something we need to keep in mind. We imbibe it and we are converted to a new way of thinking. Now pause a minute here to think about what I've just said. Culture, therefore, is a system of representations where and through which certain ways of thinking are given to you as normal entertainment as as innocent plain entertainment but which actually conceals a system of social relations a system of power a system of domination and subordination culture is therefore not neutral culture is not innocent culture is never pure entertainment this insight is what we need to keep in mind the insight that all cultural practices encode a system of power relations, which are presented to us as innocent, routine jokes, recreational practices or leisure. The superstructure, which is culture, rests on an economic base, but that how it rests is never very clear. The shift from base to superstructure is made possible because of culture. This is something we need to keep in mind, how the base gets into the superstructure. Around the 1920s, a group of social sociologists and social theorists, Theodore Adorno, Walter Benjamin, Max Horkheimer, came together to form a whole new school of sociology called the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School wrote across disciplines, mass media, cultural studies, uh, theories of power, were important for one particular essay that we all read in our cultural studies classrooms, and that is the culture industry. The Horkheimer Adorno essay on the culture industry. Now, you will be struck by the title, the culture industry, because we always think of industry as connected with factories and 
culture as related to other things like entertainment and, and education, um, films or, or whatever. The important aspect of this particular essay was it showed the people how culture works like an industry and how this relies upon a certain ideological condition. Let me explain. The first thing the Frankfurt School has told us and which we ought not to forget when we do any culture studies is the general public are consumers of any fashion trend, music, film, sports celebrity, whatever. This mass group of people are unthinking and passive consumers and for any cultural practice to make a profit, you have to make sure it is marketed to these masses. Who will consume it? Unthinkingly. In other words, what we are looking at is, culture works as a system of profits for the capitalist and as entertainment for the masses. You have to bring them together and you get, I am simplifying of course, the culture industry. The culture industry is where several ideologies, political positions, political uh, oppositions are circulated, spread out, disseminated among the people because they don't think. The biggest contribution the Frankfurt School makes is to say that the audience is a passive, inert consumer. The audience does not ask, why is this like this? Why are you representing it like this? They consume, they imbibe, they, they assimilate without worrying about the politics of it. Now please understand, this is not because they are stupid. The audience is not stupid. The point that the Frankfurt School cautions us about is ideology is so powerful in the way it operates, in the way it uh, presents its case, we cannot see the shifts and the audience does not detect the problems. So we look at the Kingfisher calendar and we do not see anything other than women. We do not ask, is it necessary to sell a bottle of beer a car or a mobile phone via the woman? Because as unthinking consumers, we say that's just innocent representation or that's just a stupid joke. The point is it's not a stupid joke. The point is this so-called stupid joke is only the concealing layer under which the unequal nature of gender relations exists. That men look at women as commodities, the marketing people draw or paint them as commodities, and the tradespeople sell them as commodities. So the, the layering from economic conditions, please note what I have said, they sell them as commodities. That is the system of social relations. It's also the system of economic production. So the woman who is sold as a commodity is first sold as a representation, as an image, as a symbol, as a fashionista, whatever, whatever you want to think of that. In other words, what we are looking at here, and this is the Frankfurt School extending into uh, structural Marxism of Althusser and uh, Raymond Williams. We assume the superstructure is devoid of all of this. And the masses say, that's great fun. When we say that's great fun, we automatically assume it's non-political, that it's apolitical. The message that is sent through, that it has been the film or whatever, is pitched at a level where we do not think of it as political. Now, the important point here to note is political power never manifests as political power. It manifests as something innocent like a cultural process. It is about identity. It's about money. We don't recognize any of that. In structural Marxism that comes with Frankfurt School, Louis Althus and others, we are told, look, this is dangerous. It's dangerous because the consumer is converted into an unthinking mass imbibing these ones and that's how politics spreads. I have convinced you about this lesson in Marxism, you all become Marxists. What does that mean? It means very simply what I have been saying has convinced you ideologically, has convinced you to imagine differently. Are you thinking about what I have said? Do you have problems with what I have said? Do you dispute what I have said? Does the institution allow this? Does the classroom allow this? You know that in most classes, teachers say, don't ask me any questions. 
The minute the teacher says that, what is the teacher doing? The teacher is saying, I say out of knowledge, you listen. We are set. This process of controlling, of dominating a system of thinking via ideology is called hegemony. Hegemony is dominance. In one word, it's dominance. Now, I don't necessarily say that dominance has to be achieved by beating people, by arresting people. And this is the crucial part we gain from a Marxist thinker called Antonio Gramsci. Dominance and subordination, power and powerlessness are not necessarily achieved through beating people up. It is also achieved very subtly through ideological superstructures. Louis Althusser would speak about ideological state apparatuses like the family, like the church, like the market, like the films medium and all that. What these apparatuses do is to impose the opinion of one class of people upon the other class. To go back to the example I gave, if you are not convinced by what I have said, what I'm trying to explain to you, you can say, I don't understand. Are you given the opportunity to do so? In a classroom, does the teacher say, I welcome contradictory opinions? Teachers don't say that. Why? The minute the student says that, the teacher's dominant position is disturbed. The teacher does not welcome contradictions simply because the teacher's dominance requires passive acceptance of this system of relations. Look at what we have come back to. We are again talking about social relations. The teacher as the dominant, the student as the dominated or the subordinate. The important thing about hegemony is hegemony operates through a far more subtle means but reinforces any and every system that is of unequal power. So the teacher says, you better listen to me. This is what I'm saying. The student who says, maybe there is another view is actually shifting the power relations in that class by saying, you may be the teacher, but I have a point of view that is, that's going to contradict yours. So the power relation between teacher and student gets a little disturbed. Teachers don't want that. Institutions don't want that. Which means effectively, we have imposed the teacher's point of view upon the student. Now, how is this going to operate? We do not quite know yet. We see it happening in various places. What does the teacher gain? What does the thinker gain? What does the politician gain? The politician gains various things, which we know. But that's not our subject. We are talking about culture. I may not be able to convert all that I gain into money. But I gain something else. I gain something called cultural capital. Cultural capital is an unquantifiable, non-measurable advantage I get from possessing, say, knowledge. Cultural capital operates in very odd ways. It operates through influence. It operates through prestige. Prestige is something very difficult to pin down as to what it does. But for instance, if you are a person who lives in India long enough, you will know. If you want to get anything done, you get somebody who will put in a word for you. What is that supposed to mean? It means very simply, the person who puts in a word has something called influence. We put that within quotes. Influence is a system of power. Influence is a system of hegemony. Where the person who puts in a word on your behalf is able to change the course of actions of the other people. Influence is cultural capital. Prestige is cultural capital. Now, cultural capital, like I said, is not monetized. It's not converted into immediate material benefits. It does not manifest as money, for instance, or buildings and things like that. It changes its nature into something else because the person who has cultural capital becomes, say, famous or influential. It's a powerful man. When you say a man is powerful, it does not mean he's a weightlifter. It means very simply, he can influence somebody else by other means. Cultural capital is important because it tells us something about, again, to go back to what I began with, the system of production, questions of power, and questions of social relations. The man who has power 
does not necessarily own a factory. The man who has power, however, still imposes this power through specific means. Those means are cultural. This brings us to what is at the heart of what we are doing in Marxism and cultural studies and cultural theory. When we study any cultural practice, whether it is the IPL, whether it's calendars, whether it's automobiles, we are effectively talking questions of power. And when we talk questions of power, we are talking about systems of production, process, profit, wage. But we are also talking about hegemony and ideology. You can at this point say, but um, all culture doesn't say this, stay the same way all the time. You are absolutely right. Raymond Williams argued that we need to discern between, distinguish between dominant culture, resistant culture and emergent culture. If you look at cultural practices like films, the family is promoted as a dominant structure of social organization in all of them, whether it's Hollywood or Bollywood, the family is at the centerpiece of everything, right? The family is part of a dominant cultural system. It is idealized. It is given to you as a possible solution to most social problems. It is what gives you an identity and so on and so forth. What I'm saying is a dominant cultural practice is effectively giving you an ideology. Not as ideology. Do understand I said ideology is invisible, but as something to be thought about, considered. All cultural forms have a dominant aspect to it, whether it's about masculinity, whether it's about the family, whether it's about religion or whatever you want to think about. But at some point, these dominant cultural forms and ideologies meet up with some kind of resistance, where some people will say, no, but I don't agree with what, what is going on here. I don't like what's going on here. I think it takes away my freedom, my identity or whatever. All cultural practices also have a certain resistant cultures emerging from within it. By resistance, I don't necessarily, please understand, uh, mean violent uh, actions to overthrow a cultural form that was the Chinese uh, cultural revolution in the 1920s under Mao. That's not what I'm speaking about. I'm speaking about say films or cultural practices that question the dominant ideology that will, for example, ask, why should families be of this kind? Why can't there be woman-centered families? Um, why should political powers be operating in this fashion? Why can we not think of alternate systems of government? The minute people ask these questions, you're getting a culture divided into the dominant and the resistant, where the resistance says, there are problems, that's patriarchal or that's classist or that's caste ridden. When we say that, we immediately say, okay, so the dominant form is not 100% dominant. It meets up with some resistance. So dominant and resistant. There is a third category. You surely know things like street theater or uh, alternate media and alternate cinema. What are these forms? Now, when we talk cinema, we invariably think of Hollywood, Bollywood and the large film industries across the world. What do you think of alternate cinema? Radically different um, filmmaking systems, stories, uh, choreography, everything is different. What do we say about those? What these do is not cater to the masses. Please remember what I said about the cultural industry. They don't cater to the masses. They, 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 they have a very small percentage of people to whom they are addressing the, the, these comments, these ideas and ideologies. These are what we can think of as emergent cultures. Emergent cultures start off as subcultural forms. Subcultures are cultures within cultures, small, terribly specialized forms of cultural practices. Punk starts off as a subcultural practice in the United States. Uh, tattooisms, all those things that they do are subcultural forms. Emergent cultures destabilize the established dominant modes. They offer you new ways of thinking about family, sexuality, growing up, age. And we say, you know what, we never thought of these structures in this fashion. Emergent cultures are important because they directly address the 
ideological structures that rule cultural practices. They question the foundations of those and they say there's a different way of thinking, there's a different way of seeing things. Now, if you look at what we have done all through here, we have moved from systems of production through cultural forms to alternate cultural forms. Alternate cultural forms are important because they give us a little bit of critical space where we can actually distinguish between the dominant ideology and the resistant one, where we can actually say there is an ideology. For cultural studies, Marxism becomes very important because it brings together two things, two concepts and two ideas which you have never put together, culture and power. Culture and power are to be read together. They are to be read as consisting of each other. There is no culture which is not about power. There is no power which does not have a cultural form. Marxism's greatest contribution to cultural studies is therefore to say that there is no such thing as innocent culture. Thank you. How much time was that? So let me quickly summarize what we have done. What we have looked at is Marxism and its approach to cultural studies as a theoretical framework and Marxism's reading of culture. What we have been looking at so far is the question of linking culture with power, to look at how power operates, to look at concepts like ideology, hegemony and cultural capital. We looked at the Frankfurt School, we looked at variations of the Marxist model in Louis Althusser, Raymond Williams, Antonia Gramsci, where we discussed how what looks like innocent cultural practice or entertainment actually is a hidden way of speaking about ideological formations. And these ideological formations are reliant upon and reinforce unequal social relations. Thank you.